All righty, folks, thank you for joining us. Um, hopefully in a moment, you'll be able to use the chat function to just uh, introduce yourselves into the space as you're comfortable and then where you're joining from. Uh, my name is Kamari Excel. I use she, her pronouns. I'm joining from the land of the Council of Three Fires, also known as Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I'm the Director of Project Management here at Just Making a Change for Families, also more commonly known as JMAC for Families. For those of you who are just getting familiar with our work, we are a nonprofit working to dismantle the family policing system while investing in the community support that we know keeps families safe and together. Uh, we are a team of impacted people, social workers, advocates, and organizers working towards the ultimate goal of abolition. We work towards this goal on a daily basis through narrative change, uh, storytelling, legislative advocacy, and healing center programming that uh, is directly meant to proliferate the stories and lived experiences of folks impacted by the family policing system. I'll briefly take a pause just to acknowledge that term family policing system or family policing, which we will frequently be using in this webinar to refer to what is commonly called the child welfare system. This is done intentionally to reflect the current and historical surveillance, threats to reproductive autonomy and regulation of Black, Indigenous, and Latinx families. I also want to acknowledge the timeliness of our conversation. We're here today gathered in the spirit of Juneteenth in the middle, or actually I should say the end of Family Preservation Month, as well as, as last week on June 24th, it's been one year since the fall of Roe v. Wade. So our hour spent together is not only timely, but it's extremely necessary. We are joined by three dynamic speakers and advocates who I will introduce um, as they come up today that'll guide us in answering the questions, where have we been, where are we now, and where will we be? Uh, just as Juneteenth is a holiday commemorating the freedom of enslaved Black folks in this country and all the ways that we have resisted the violence of white supremacy and other interlocking forms of oppression, it also illuminates the ways that descendants of those Black folks today are still experiencing the reverberations of the afterlife of slavery. As stated by our founder, Joyce McMillan, from the plantation to the present, breaking up Black families has always meant profit. The statement reminds us that the reproductive control of Black families is inherently tied to the nation's fabric and wealth building. It also reminds us that the family policing system is not by any means a modern conception. Enslaved Black folks were frequently separated from their spouses, children, parents, loved ones, and the lands that they had gotten close to being sent to new plantations where they would once again be subjugated to continuous violence and have to recreate bonds that could be shattered in the blink of an eye. Indigenous families also face forced removals, uprooting them from their ancestral homelands, with Indigenous children being sent to boarding schools where they were subjugated to assimilation, displacement, violence, and murder. This deliberate separation aimed to weaken family structures, strip away cultural ties, and maintain control. The family policing system has continued to evolve over time, which Dr. Roz will illuminate for us more in a moment. Adapting to social norms and legal frameworks, it has persisted through discriminatory practices such as redlining and the expansion of the prison and medical industrial complexes. Today, we are gathered to do the work of resistance and uprooting the system that is so deeply intertwined into our nation's history. Before the Union soldiers in Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865, notified the enslaved folks of their freedom they had fought for and had dreamt of. They dreamt of a world where they did not need to be productive but could rest freely, experience joy uninhibited, where they could enjoy their cultural practices and didn't have to worry about their loved ones being taken as they tirelessly worked the fields and returned home to no one. As you listen to us today in conversation, we encourage you to step outside what we call at JMAC for Families, the carceral box, and into a spirit of radical freedom dreaming, which has always been a part of how Black folks have survived and created new worlds in spite of, which Shalanda and Desiree will hope, you know, ground us in that thinking as we continue our conversation. Family policing is a reproductive human rights and social justice issue. And whether this is your first conversation or your millionth one, we hope that after exiting the space today, you feel empowered and called to not only just talk about the horrors of the system, but action to uproot it from its very core. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box, as well as utilizing the chat to build community with other folks um, and to acknowledge your presence in the space. 
Uh, we'll have time at the end of our talk today for a brief Q&A portion and whatever we don't get through today will be used um, as a catalyst for future webinars and programming. So thank you all so much for allowing me to ground us in this conversation. Uh, now that we've gotten a bit more of the layout of you know, what we're gonna be moving through today, I'd like to first introduce Dr. McCall Ross, who is a Charles E. and Dale L. Phillips professor in public policy and health at the University of Rochester and a practicing adult hospitalist at Strong Memorial Hospital. A scholar of the history of child welfare policy, she is the author of three books, most recently, Abusive Policies, How the American Child Welfare System Lost Its Way. She has published, published extensively on the imperative nature to protect children and families from coercive child welfare intervention and the harms of conflating poverty with neglect. A sought after speaker, Roz has been invited to testify before different legislative bodies, primarily on the topic of mandated reporting. Dr. Roz, I'll pass it to you to help us better understand the modern roots of this system. Thank you so much. And I'm really thrilled to be here in conversation with you all and in community with you all. And just to say how inspired I am by the work of activists and JMAC for families. Um, I, I'm a historian, so I think a lot about, you know, how we've ended up where we're at. Uh, and it's an interesting history. So since the 1970s, we've been seeing this vast shift in what we consider to be child abuse and neglect. And of course, uh, concurrent expansion in coercive interventions uh, by the so-called child welfare system or what we refer to as the family policing system. And parents are given less freedom. They can't make certain decisions for their kids. They can't let them play unsupervised in, in a playground while mom has to work. Or they can't wait in the car for a second while parent runs a quick errand. Even though we know that society is actually safer uh, and has lower rates of violent crime. And so parenting has been completely transformed into a constant role of vigilance and supervision, but completely divorced from the actual risks. And why does that matter? Well. It's not great in general, but it particularly disadvantages low-income parents, particularly moms who need to balance work, childcare, and these expectations of constant supervision in a society that fails to offer even the basic standards of supports from moms, such as guaranteed maternity leave, sick leave, or high quality affordable childcare. So how do we create this system of family policing that essentially sets up poor families to fail? How can we have a system in which one out of every third kid in this country and half of all black kids is going to be a subject of a child protection investigation? So when I always tell my students, well, everything has a history. Uh, it didn't just happen. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. And I, you know, I wrote a whole book about this. I have 10 minutes. So I'm just gonna flag two main decisions that I think have had a profound impact and the evolution of child welfare policy. And I'm saying decisions because we should rem remember that we make decisions, things don't just happen. And once we identify these decisions, we can make different decisions. Uh, so the first decision is to pathologize certain groups of parents, always asking, what is wrong with them? Why are these poor parents, you know, what is wrong with these people? Rather than asking, what are the risk factors that make kids less safe? And how can we work to keep kids safer? And the second is the decision to singularly focus on reporting as our primary response to concerns about child safety. And these are not inevitable, inevitable decisions, and they're not necessary or even based on evidence. They're the result of political expedience. And so when we think about this history, we learn about how we ended up with these policies, but also can we free ourselves from these preconceptions and try to envision a different system that supports rather than investigates families and ensures children can thrive. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of child abuse because of course, Unfortunately, children have always been hurt uh, physically, emotionally, sexually in their homes. But child abuse is a relatively new term. And it's kind of people always base it to the 1960s and the rise of a medical category, the battered child by a pediatrician who really created this idea of child abuse as a medical category. And even from the beginning, they said, you know, this abuse is related to some kind of defect of character that causes parents to be violent. And once he came up with this 1962 uh, publication, there was an explosion of child abuse literature of doctors thinking about child abuse as a medical problem and using medicalized theories to try to make sense of what something that doesn't make sense. You know, how can people hurt innocent kids? Um, a lot of publications about what is wrong with people who hurt their children. Uh, and by adopting these medicalized explanations for child abuse, physicians are able to maintain their jurisdiction on what is actually a complex social problem. And it also helps to depoliticize 
what essentially is a political problem, the treatment of poor and struggling families. But this focus doesn't actually match the evidence. Everyone's asking, you know, what's wrong with these people? How do we fix them? What is a medical problem? But we actually know that that's not true. In the 1970s, there was a lot of data that showed that poverty, racism, homelessness, joblessness, isolation, or even not having a landline telephone at home are all risk factors for abuse. And I say this as a parent, parenting is actually really hard. And without sufficient support or respite, parents are more likely to snap. And this is not like me being radical, and it wasn't radical at the time. We know that socioeconomic hardship is a risk factor for child abuse. There are studies today that have shown that at times of economic crisis, there are higher rates of physical abuse for babies uh, and so on. We, we actually know that poverty is bad for children and other living things. Uh, so at the time, many researchers argued that we should address poverty, racism, social inequities as factors in child abuse. So unsurprisingly, these voices were unheeded by politicians and policymakers who didn't really have an appetite to try to fix the social context, which makes kids less safe. So two main approaches emerge. One is medicalized, what's wrong with these people? And the other, focusing on the risk factor that make kids less safe. But as I alluded already, policymakers have a vested interest in adopting a narrow medicalized view of child welfare rather than one that actually makes you fix things. Um, and they weren't the only ones, activists also weighed in on the debate. And in my book, I spent a lot of time thinking about the group called Parents Anonymous, which is a group of primarily white women who were educated, uh, middle class. And I'm mostly worried about they might verbally abuse their kids, or not even physically abuse. But they expanded the ideas of physical abuse to be like everything we don't like is abuse, uh, emotional abuse, uh, emotional neglect. And they actively worked to discount the role of poverty and discrimination. And why do I, you know, why am I talking about this? So I'm just going to put a pin here in this moment to remind us that expanding definitions of child abuse and calling kind of different behaviors as abusive is, is a choice. An activist had played a choice and different activists can try to change the discourse. Um, but it's also kind of part of a bigger story of how people in the name of protecting children uh, develop policies that are carceral, coercive, and actually don't serve to protect children. So by calling emotional neglect a form of abuse, you're not actually making kids safer, you're just ensnaring more families. Uh, but by the 1970s, a lot of child welfare experts, regardless of their politics, they all agree that poverty is a risk factor for child abuse and neglect, and they talk about how we could fix this. But this never went ma mainstream. Uh, and one reason was the concern that if we talk about this, it could potentially pathologize poor parents and their home life. Because by linking poverty and abuse, one might say, you know, poor parents are worse parents, rather than poverty is bad for kids. Also, anti-poverty measures are not popular in the mid-1970s, although child welfare advocates keep on saying that, you know, you want kids to be safe, you gotta fix the poverty. Um, and of course, there's this idea that if we just report more parents, we appear tough on abuse, and it appears at least to cost nothing, whereas supporting poor parents could cost money. So while attempts to support families and address poverty were really never, uh, never caught on, the 1970s saw a growing emphasis on one aspect of child maltreatment, which I alluded to earlier, the choice to focus on reporting. This began in the 70s and exploded in the 1970s. This began in the 60s and exploded in the 70s when the first Federal Child Abuse Prevention Act passes, and that's CAPTA. Um, and we hear from Senator Walter Mondale and different you know, activists, including Parents Anonymous, serving as witnesses. And CAPTA is signed into law in by 1974. And it emphasizes uh, the reporting of abuse and setting federal standards of what is required and states open hotlines and have campaigns to, to you know, save a child's life, say something, and reports start pouring in. Uh, but not surprising, these reports are primarily about struggling families, poverty, hunger, addiction, and inadequate supervision. But there were no further appropriations of money to provide services. And so at each political juncture, policymakers worked to expand reporting and increase penalties without actually expanding services. Uh, the harms, primarily to poor families and families of color, were easily foreseen. So this focus on reporting is essentially a form of political theater to look tough. But only some families pay the price. Black families, poor families, and of course, indigenous families and, until uh, ICWA is passed. Uh, in fact, reports of child abuse and maltreatment are increasing at exactly the same time that states are cutting funding for services. So you get a report 
but it doesn't actually help families because they don't get more services. So you report somebody for being hungry, but it's not that the kid is being fed and more kids are being reported and more kids are being removed. In 1962, 272,000 children in foster care in the United States, which is the rate of 3.9 per thousand. Uh, a decade later, we're looking at almost 320,000 at a rate of 4.4 per thousand. Uh, by the late 1970s, 1977, we have over half a million children in foster care. These kids are disproportionately poor and black. And with these high rates of kids in out-of-home care, it's essentially inevitable that you put kids in dangerous situations. And we just heard about like a foster family running a, a, a sexual abuse um, ring. You know, kids are placed in places that are not regulated in which they can be abused. Uh, whereas they were removed from perfectly good families that just were poor. So people start paying attention that kids are being abused in foster care and foster care is also expensive uh, and the cost is rising uh, and the state and federal governments have to pay attention. So all this brings together that people say, well, maybe kids shouldn't be in foster care for so long, which helps shape a new law. I talked about the first one, CAPTA, which is 1974. And now I'm talking about the Adoption and Assistance Child Welfare Act, ACWA, that passes in 1980. And President Carter signs ACWA, which is designed to reduce the number of kids in foster care. And in two ways. First, try to remove fewer kids by providing services, which is, you know, narrowing the front door. It's, it's a laudable cause. And then creating a federal adoption assistance program for kids in the system who can't go home. So it is essentially a family preservation uh, services program designed to reduce removal. But it couldn't have passed at a worse time, 1980. As it passes uh, and the Reagan administration comes into power in, in January 1981, they made it abundantly clear that they plan to cut services for child welfare serve and to limit appropriations for these kind of preservation services. But it would be wrong to say that family preservation failed because it was underfunded. That wasn't the only reason. The problem was that there were no real guidance about you know, what is family preservation? What should it look like? What does it do? Um, and for the most part, these programs were designed to fix families by offering short-term casework, therapy, parent education. The idea was still something is wrong with these parents and we should fix them rather than fixing the poverty and the material challenges that these parents faced. And as such, these interventions were designed and destined to fail, setting the stage to argue that family preservation was useless or even dangerous. And this has far reaching implications. The, these underfunded, ineffective family fixing attempts, they emerge as a legacy of ACWA. And so child welfare experts and policymakers viewed the deficiency of these family preservation approaches to say, you know what, family preservation has been tried and failed. It doesn't work. Setting the stage for the 1997 passage of the Adoption and Safe Families Act. And ASFA reduces the requirements for family preservation attempts. It exempts certain people from having any preservation and shift the focus towards freeing kids for adoption. It emphasizes rapid termination of parental rights based on arbitrary timeline, but even in cases in which there is no abuse. So you, even if you're, you've never abused your child, if the kid has been out of your care 15 of the past 22 months, it's incumbent on the state to move forward to terminate parental rights unless there's a compelling reason that they have to justify why they're not doing it. Essentially, if we say that fixing parents doesn't work, then the next logical step in this history is to just move forward and give kids new parents through adoption. And that's the culmination of an approach that looks at abuse as a problem with individual parents' psychological makeup and ignores everything else that's going on in society. So fixing parents by offering them parenting classes, anger management classes, intensive therapy, and so on, has not been proven to be beneficial. It has parents running across town and, and buses to take, you know, four different buses and miss work to get their certificate for this and that. And it's based on the fall of the assumption that something's wrong with these people. Parents are often coerced to participate. They have to do their certifications. If you don't do this on time, you're not going to see your kid again. You know, what if instead of offering, instead of making people do stuff they don't want in order to get a piece of paper, what if we offered stuff that they do want, services that they clamor to participate in rather than being forced to? Get to? What if we gave them high quality childcare? What if our services were affordable housing? Rather than trying to fix parents, we should focus on fixing poverty and the risk factor that we know since the 1970s as being harmful to kids and families and to ensure that we can lift up families to thrive and grow without coercive interventions. Rather than giving money to put kids in foster care outside their communities because we know that foster care payments follow the child. So you put a kid, you take them out of their home and they get paid to go somewhere else. 
uh, we could reinvest these funds in communities. And I'm just going to end my comments with this quote. You know, in the heartbreaking case of Makia Bryant, who was shot by the police outside her foster home, Makia's mourning grandmother, Ms. Janine Hammett, she told the New York Times that her lack of housing was a reason she couldn't care for her granddaughter. And she was living in a hotel at the time. And I'm going to quote, they could have just given me what they give one foster parent. And I could have gotten housing, taken care of the kids, and done what I needed to do, end of quote. And I think we should all think about that. How could we think of different ways to support families and keep children safe? Thank you so much for your time and attention. I look forward to engaging with the other speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Raz. I think that history is so important to really draw on that, that fear that was created, right? And the, the urgency to fix families versus properly um, fixing and abolishing the very systems that have created this structure. So thank you for giving us that very nuanced wide view. And um, I dropped the link to Dr. Raz's book in the chat. I highly encourage folks to, to read it, to really get the full picture of the history of these abusive policies. So thank you so much, Dr. Raz. And you know, we'll all come back together in the end for some, some Q&A. Uh, right now, I'd like to invite up Shalonda Curtis Hackett, who is a Community Outreach Coordinator for Neighborhood Defender Services of Harlem, and is also an inaugural graduate of the very first JMAC for Families Hill cohort. Uh, she is an, uh, an international and brilliant community leader, founding birth keeper of Trap House Doulas, who has published several op-eds appearing in the media to fight against family policing. She's a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and has boots on the ground working to support families impacted by the family policing system. She has spoken on several New York City Assembly Committee panels and local community events. As a birth keeper, she supports abolition practices in all aspects of society. She's an active member in each of these coalitions, Informed Consent Coalition, Repeal Capta Coalition, Alliance for Quality Education, uh, ACT, DSC, and Y Coalition, Plan Coalition, is a and is a living embodiment of community. And I can say that both personally and professionally, I'm so excited to have you in this space with us. Um, so kind of leaving from where Dr. Roz left us with this very rich look at the history, as someone who even, right, using the language from your bio, boots on the ground, uh, can you just share, right, with the folks in the space, the current harms that families are experiencing um, in the, the modern, right, iteration of the family policing system? Absolutely. I'm like so glad to be here and be able to talk about um, this, the harms that are currently happening. Um, as uh, Macau stated, there's this history, but that history hasn't gone anywhere, right? It's actually evolved. Um, I think the system, ACS and whatever it is in other parts of the country has had an evolution. Um, it has, begot has gotten stronger. Um, it has gotten better and also has gotten to a point where a lot of us believe in the system, right? Like we believe that we need this system um, in order to protect children, quote unquote. But honestly, what we have and what I see with clients within myself, because I'm an impacted parent as well, is that all it does is strikes harm everywhere that it goes. It's a fire that is continuously burning. Um, what we see is that when folks actually need services, when folks actually want support, they rarely ever get it. Or when they do get that service, it's not individualized, right? We're pathologized in the system from the door to the courtroom. Um, we are not innocent, right? Like that innocent until proven guilty is not an opportunity that's afforded to us under the family regulation system. We are fighting for our lives, and I don't think anyone uh, anyone on the opposing end of that realizes that, that our children are our lives and any threat to that, we're not gonna <laughs> walk through that with a smile on our face. And so that's another thing. Parents are having to become actors. They're having to hold down and push down real emotion, real fear, real anger, real sadness, because any of those emotions are gonna be used against them as a reason why their children needs to be separated from them. When someone walks into your home, you are having to, you know, utilize a space of, of if it has to be clean, are they, gonna, or are they gonna, you know, remove because of that? If I don't have enough food, all these things that could be addressed within community are not addressed. They're just used to uh, be put on a, a case note and used against you. 
um, when you get, if you go to court, because I want people to realize too, that a lot of people don't technically go to court because ACS has the ability to, to render a founded case or unfounded case without ever having to go to court. And they do this by ways of coercion. They, they come to your home and say to you, if you just let me in, you know, we can, we can take care of this. This can get better or this can go away. And that's just the start. That's just the fuse, right? Or they don't tell families their rights. You have a right not to let me in. You have a right to seek counsel. Um, we have early defense in New York City. Most people don't even know that that exists. If it does go into court, you have to deal with the racism in court. A lot of uh, judges and people who work in court are not trauma response uh, trained. They don't know. They become judges when they become judges, and that's it. They no longer tap back into what's evolving in our society and how to support people and what that actually looks like, and then they put the, 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 the gavel down. And then now it's a, just a perpetuation of furthering the divide between families and their children if they are removed. Understanding that the longer a child is in custody, because I'm gonna call it what it is, custody, the likelihood of them returning and returning back in one piece is not there. And then we have the other end of that. When your case is closed, where an investigation didn't lead into anything, or your children are returned, we have no recourse for the four for safety. We have no recourse for putting our families back together, talking to our children about the traumas that were a part of an investigation, were a part of that separation. It's just like, we did this to you. You got your kids back. Be happy. And so there's a lot that is missing from this system that was never designed in the way that it is that community has. And unfortunately, capitalism and the way in the society that we that we live in, our communities are not funded in the way that these big organizations and the billions amount of money is. So we know what's needed and what's not. I think the one of the most profound um, kind of resistance and pushback to exactly what you're talking about is the power and the importance of community care and having a very concrete definition of what that not only looks like, but also what that feels like when you're speaking about the judges, right? And their kind of blank statements and their ability to, to not see the nuance of individual families, right? It's like seeing what's exactly on the paper, not questioning, not getting to know a family or a community. Um, I think a lot about the Freedom Friday spaces that you had held for the past two months. Um, and I was lucky enough to be able to be in that space for one of the sessions. But can you talk about your overall just like approach to community care? And then also just about that series and your intention for holding that space for folks to, to gather? Absolutely. I mean, we had 10 weeks to come up with what do we bring to the community and what the community can bring to us. Because I think what happens in the system is right is what we're going to do this for you. We don't care if you like it, don't like it. Um, we're going to do this. You're going to take it. And how dare you question anything that we bring into the community. Friday Freedom Dreams was very opposite of that. While we had our structure of what we wanted to introduce, what happened in the space was organic. So the first sessions were definitely around the current bills that were uh, at our, our legislation, which was informed consent, um, anti-harassment, um, Miranda. And so we wanted to educate, right? Because a lot of people don't have, this information is not like readily available. It's not like we have it plastered everywhere. Um, it's not that a lot of people are in tune to what's happening civilly. And so this is why bogus ass laws get passed because we just are trying to make it. We're trying to survive. And so the first portion of that was just the education part and bringing in people from different professions, experiences to have that conversation together, which doesn't happen in the system, right? So in that space, we had current social workers who work in defense. We had medical providers. We had impacted parents. We had impacted youth um, and people currently in the system and not. And so we were able to foster a relationship and a trust 
that we could share our experiences and build from that. And it also wasn't so data driven, right? It was about the real experiences that were happening with folks. And in every session, it evolved into something else. We wanted to highlight the impacts and the correlation between the medical industrial complex. We wanted to, to, to bring in the aspects of school, you know, ACS, uh, school to ACS pipeline, which not a pipeline prerequisite, right? Which Joyce says, right? We wanted to talk about all those relationships and who's helping this system stay intact. And from there, we also wanted to make space for joy because we get into these fights, we get into these things, Black women, we're always upholding this country and we're always the advocates, but where do we have an opportunity and a, and a moment for joy? So I've made it a point to have a womb healing ceremony because we educate ourselves, we motivate, we're out here marching, we're doing all of these things and we keep the movement going, but we can tend to burn ourselves out trying to burn it down. <laughs> and so it was important to bring in those spaces of, of joy on purpose, right? And, and, and leaving uh, members that came to the space with the opportunity to take that home with them when you're alone, when you're trying to get through Mother's Day and you don't have your children, when you're trying to get through Father's Day and you don't have your children. Um, how do you get through that? Because we've seen, we see in, in the media what happens to folks when they don't have their children. Some people are unaliving themselves. Some people, the mental health, it goes, goes way down in ACS or CPS or whatever. It's not providing the individualized care um, and growth that a community needs. We know that we're disproportionately targeted. So then we have to then on our end, on a community end, fill in the hole that the system has created. I, I can definitely say that the experience of being able to, as you're saying, right, build that really deep community, allow it to be a space to also experience that joy, which so often people see outside of um, the fight or that we can't be holding grief and joy in the same moments and flow between those two things. And so, more of those spaces, more of folks um, allowing us to freedom dream and see what's on the other side. Um, just to, to end here, as you were wrapping up this 10 weeks time with folks, um, if you could give you know, people in the audience like two major takeaways of like either personally what you were, were sitting with after or like an action step that collectively um, you and the different folks who came to the space over the 10 weeks kind of really sat with? Um, I think one of the major things that I took away from this space is that everyone has a voice, right? I think that in this fight and in this movement, we're talking about the voiceless. No one's voiceless, right? It's who's actually being listened to and who's being heard and what do we do with that information once we know it. A lot of people wanna turn a blind eye to what's happening with this system. If it doesn't happen to them, it's not relevant. Um, or the parent must have done something to, to bring this onto themselves. And what I took, what we took away from that is developing those systems of community and care. We develop roadmaps of if this is happening to you and you need a parent advocate and you can't, and it's not afforded to you within the system, because again, if you don't have a case, then you can't get certain services, then how can we create that, right? How can we create that defense? around our communities. So we developed things called like a uh, living will of support. That was one thing that came out of that. That's just like, who's your support system? Because when the system comes to attack you, they're holistic. They have everything interlocked and interwoven, ready to take you and your family down. So who do you have that can support you? When we go into court these days, the courts are empty. There's no one supporting people. And honestly, it's been built that way because of shame, because of fear. You don't wanna tell family members, you don't wanna let people know. But in that space, in that freedom dreaming space, we created a bond and a trust that if there's a person who was in that space with us, they have my number, they can call me and say, I need this and I need that. We're still talking about more education around folks who are not afforded, uh, public defense, but have 18 Bs. What are your rights within that? There's so much information and so much that is built into the law that does protect us, but it's so flipped around and that we think that 
we can't do anything. And so out of Friday Freedom Dreams definitely came a sense of community, trust, and a place to continue to build. Thank you so much, Shalanda. We will, of course, circle back in our final Q&A, but that living will of support just feels like such an important um, model, because right, like you're saying, these are models of community care that we could all be amplifying. So thank you so much. We'll see you back in a few. Um, next, I would love to invite Desiree Wright up into the space. And I think it's such a perfect segue from Shalanda to Des to talk about um, this, this preconceived notion, right, that we are fighting for the voiceless, um, when in reality, as Shalanda said, right, we all have a voice, and Desiree is uh, directly doing work around storytelling. Um, she's also a part of the first inaugural HEAL program, and also currently works at um, Bronx Defender Services. So please, Desiree, I'd love for you to introduce yourself, and we can get into more about the work that you're doing right now. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, everybody. I just had a little bit of problems here trying to connect in. Um, hi, everybody. Yes, my name is Desiree Wright. I use she, her pronouns. I'm an affected parent. I graduated from Hostos College and uh, top of my class on criminal justice. Um, I've been doing this work for whew, quite some time now, uh, really uh, advocating, running up to Albany, speaking to legislators, trying to move and shake things. Uh, met Shalanda a long time ago. We've been in the Shahil program together, graduated the same cohort. Um, Shalanda is my sister for real. <laughs> uh, we really carry this work together. Me, Shalanda, Joyce, uh, Erica, it's a bunch of us. Um, and we really love these spaces. Um, we're just one big family. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit uh, about what I do. Uh, yeah, I work for the Bronx Defenders now. Uh, I did intern with MFP, uh, plan, uh, work with plan. I'm uh, part of the committee. I'm doing so much stuff, yeah, it's like crazy, but um, I'm loving the work, I'm loving the fight, and so, yeah. Yes, definitely yeah. emphasizing that Des has been integral to this, these spaces, <laughs> and so we're so happy to have you here with us today. Um, can you talk about you and your work that you've been doing in this moment, orchestrating a play that explores the stories of families impacted by family policing? I'd love for folks to just know like what that has looked like for you in terms of process. And then, um, yeah, just like your method of uh, story collection and sharing that with folks. Yes, yes. I am working on a play with a group of parents uh, with the goal of changing the narrative that folks have about parents impacted by the system. People look at us like bad, bad parents, but we are human. Um, you know, it's like they picked the pookie out the bunch. Have uh, everybody seen New Jack City? It's like they picked the pookie out the bunch. Um, but that's just not the case. We are regular people, um, parents, and the play shows that. It tells our stories. Um, it gives our narratives. Um, it actually, uh, we're we're putting a lot out there for 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 people to see, you know. Um, so it's uh very it's 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 uh it's gonna be a great uh show. Um, I love doing the work because I connect with the parents who have suffered the same trauma that I have. We are actually healing each other. It's a, it's um it's soothing to know that you're not alone. These stories have the have the power to be helpful, to be help, uh, to help build empathy for impacted families and to explain the system. Um, we really want people to walk away knowing that um, the system is treating poverty as neglect. Uh, as we are sharing our personal stories, we want to make sure that um, to incorporate some comedy. For example, uh, we want to uh, do a skit about our advocacy and how often legislators will tell us verbally that they support our bill, but really they are thinking the opposite. So yeah, uh, like we wanna highlight a lot in this play and that's like one of the big things, yes. Yeah, I also yeah. love to hear the like comedic elements that are gonna be in the play because so much of when, right, outside forces try and take parent stories, it's all about the trauma and the pain, but 
for you like leading the space that is going to have a lot more nuance it feels like I'm, I'm super excited to see it um, and then I'm also wondering for you why art like why pick a play right there's a lot of ways and you're someone who has written numerous op-eds but I'm always interested when people choose art as like a medium to to share and tell stories so if you want to give us insight of why you picked a play sure art is a way of turning anger into activism right laws that laws that are about us are being made without us so we need a place to step forward and let our voices be heard theater is an important place to get parents voices out there theater can highlight the reality of what is really going on out here and highlights the struggles parents go through in a way that people cannot connect with it's like a movie right and the media has so much control over what's being said about families so often parents have no control over what's being said about them Art is a way for us to take the power back and tell our own stories. We are the only ones who can tell our stories correctly. Your like ending point there is like going into my last question of like, there's just so much I feel like exploitation of impacted stories, right? From companies to get attention or to get highlight on their campaign. What would be like your advice or what would you share with people about like how to tell stories in a way that's like, equitable and accurate to the experiences of impacted folks? See, first of all, I always feel like um, impacted people should always be leading their work, right? Always be leading this. Everything that we do is for parents and families. It's so dangerous when people try to tell someone else's story. They won't tell it right, right? And so we have to be at the forefront of our story. When I work with parents on telling stories, I let the parents know that I am to an impacted parent so that so that they feel comfortable. I like to let them know that they don't have to share their story as well. But if they want to, they can. I let them know that it is important that they be in the front of their story at all times. Because if not, they're going to change the narrative on them. And it's them, they're going to be looked at as a bad parent. And we can no longer keep letting the world take control over our stories the way that they are doing. Second, parents should always be compensated for their work, right? Because these stories are real, like they're traumatizing to them. We never want people to share their stories for free. It is traumatizing to relive your experiences and we want to ask parents to consider doing, we don't want to ask parents to consider doing that without compensation. Our group, our group was fortunate enough to get funding for our project which allows us to offer, to offer these parents compensation. Yeah, thank you so much. I love that you use the word dangerous. That is, it's, it's dangerous to not have impacted folks spearheading and leading these spaces. And that connects so much in my mind to what Dr. Raz is speaking about, of the origins, right? Of how we even got here. So much narrative building and making that was not accurate and wasn't real. So. Thank you so much, Jez. I'd love to invite everyone else now back onto the screen for us to get into the final two questions that I have. And then if folks in the audience would like to start putting their questions in there, we'll spend like our last 10-ish minutes together in, in some Q and A. So first of all, right, virtual, just a round of applause and love to all of our amazing speakers. Um, it's always so, yeah, I, I just feel honored to get to moderate and facilitate um, this space. So at JMF for Families, we know and we believe that there will be a day where families are safe together, experiencing joy that is un unrestricted, uninhibited. Um, I think as we're having these conversations in these spaces, sometimes folks have so much fear about the how, right? When we say abolition, it's like, oh my gosh, scary. Like, how, how do we get there? Or it seems like this kind of super far out dream that, um, We'll, we'll just get to one day. But if you all were leaving folks in the space with um, insight of how we can daily embody or daily be resisting this family policing system, um, what, what would that be or what would that look like for you? And we can start in the opposite way. So, oh, oh Shalon, I see your, your hand up. We can start with Shalon. <laughs> I think definitely understanding that abolition is a framework, right? It's a it's an ever evolving framework led by Black folk. Like that's where it is. And what I want us to think about too is that where our youth are and where their voice is in this abolition movement. I think 
uh, you know, um, adult supremacy is a white supremacy framework, right? You, we tell kids what to do, where to do, how to be, and all those things. But we understand that they're intelligent and they have a lot to share within this space as well. And they know what they need too, right? And if we give them that space, if we share that space with them, that's really one of the only ways we're going to get to where we need to go. It's a community-based effort. Um, I think that that's one of the things I would like to see more in what we're doing is bringing in that youth voice, especially the impacted youth, um, and also being able to, to address the harms, right? Address it and not just be like, it doesn't happen. We're just going to move past that. No, because we need community-based solutions when harm does happen. We need that. And then what we have to understand is that on the opposite side, whoever it is, is going to use that harm to devalue the abolition movement. And so it's a space that we have to talk about and come up with community-based solutions in where that community is, because everything is not going to look the same for everyone. Um, but by not addressing it, we're just perpetually allowing this system to, to remain the way that it is. And to keep modifying itself into all these different forms. Um, Desiree or Dr. Raz, either one of you wanna hop in with this question of like the, the fear of what it means to abolish and how we do that on a, on a day to day. Let me call, please. Um, so I mean, I think, you know, people think about abolition as a scary thing. You know, abolition is a goal, it's a process, it's a, it's a practice. How we think about a world in which we don't need to police families in order, and we instead focus on helping them thrive. Uh, and so everyone's like, oh, but what about all the, you know, all the rapists and murderers? What about all the children are being hurt? And I was like, yes, what about all the children that are hurt that the child policing, the child welfare system, the family policing is actually not protecting them. Uh, and I'm on Twitter and someone's like, oh, you see a 10 year, a 10 month old baby was hurt. And I was like, yes, your system is not working. Uh, can we create a system that protects children? That is what we want. And what does that look like? Well, we already know that the child tax credit helped reduce abuse and keep children safe, that there are interventions that we can do to uplift rather than police uh, our families. And then what does an ab uh, abolition mean? It means making it redundant. So kind of like my life in my white suburb where I have four children uh, and I was by myself when my husband's in the Navy. So the smallest one went outside and she escaped from my house and the neighbor brought her back. Uh, and, and that was it. Uh, and another time, my kids walked down the street, and I'm telling all these stories about how I'm a terrible parent. Uh, my two big kids walked down the, and, and somebody called the police. And, uh, and the police came up, they apologized for being called. They put, helped me get my kids back into the car. And they were like, I don't have a great day, kid, listen to your parent. Uh, and it seemed like a joke. Uh, and that's my experience living in my white suburb. And I know that that is not the experience of so many people living in other places. So how do we create a system where, you know, the police laugh when you're being called and it's like, this is silly, why did you call me? Uh, that, that is abolition in which calling police to police certain families is a joke. Like it's, it's like uh, inconceivable. And to police other families, it's an everyday practice. So how do we create this space where everybody gets to parent without being policed? Uh, so when we already have an abolition, it's in my suburb. Um, can we share this with other places and people? The fact that there are folks and families that already get to be free and experience life and have joy um, unrestricted, right? Um, Des, anything you want to add in about, you know, when people, and I know you get this all the time as someone who's also on the ground, right, of like their fear of like, what does abolition mean? Like, how do we get to this, um, this moment, how to do it in the day to day? Yes, me, I think me and Shalanda have these conversations a lot, right? Because it's like people think that it cannot happen. And I'm like, and that's where Freedom Dreamers came in, too, right? Because it's no way, like, we can't visualize this. Like, we can visualize this without a system. We can visualize. Why Why do we, I like to think, why do we think this, this system needs to be here? Who are we really protecting? We're doing more harm, right? Like, let's be real here. Are we only policing? We're only policing black and brown communities. So why do we only think that this system belongs in our communities? Do it not belong nowhere else? Do it only just belong to us? Like, this is just us, all of us, right? So nobody else belongs to be, deserves to be policed but us, right? So if they don't need it in their communities, why do we need it in ours? Like, I want them to explain that to me. When they ask me 
I want to know what, why we need it then. We need it. If y'all hospitals is not testing y'all kids illegally, why do, our kids, why do we got to be tested? Like, uh, answer that question for me. Like, I want them to ask me, answer me that question. Like, tell me why you think you need it. Because I, I want to know why you don't need it over there, but we need it over here. So explain that to me. Then we could get somewhere. Because if they don't need it there, we don't need it here, neither. I mean, I didn't go to parents in class when I was pregnant. I didn't go to none of these classes when I was pregnant. I just went to the doctor, and that was it. I don't remember nothing about, and I don't remember the system being in the room at the baby shower or none of that. I don't remember them helping me when the lights was out, putting them back on. I don't remember, like, where they came from. Where they came from policing me like this, coming into my home, telling me what I got to do. I don't see y'all over there. I want to be on a wall over there. I want to be over there on their wall, figuring out why they don't need policing. So we can figure it out why we don't, so that we can get that same thing over there. Because I know our community helps each other. And that's what we need to get back to. It is done. It could be done. And I know it could be done because it used to be there. My big mama helped me. We got a lot of big mamas in our hoods. I don't know where these people come from. We need them up out of there. Out of there. Go back to where y'all came from. Go police the areas y'all need to go police because this is not it. Get out of our areas. Sorry, I just had to, I just had to bit a little bit there too. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, like, I, I want to know why we need it and they don't. Just want to figure it out. Help me. No, we need we needed this 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 fire as we're sending people off back into their corners of the world to do this work. We need it to be further activated. So look, no, no sorries here. You know, this is a space for that. And you're getting all the all the hearts and the amens in the chat. And yeah, and the fact that, right, like we're not doing anything that hasn't been done before, that we know, right, that this is, exists and that it's real. And in that Africa, we helped each other out in Africa. We didn't need them in Africa. We was there. We was good. Y'all came in our areas, stealing us. Right. You know what and I'm saying? Putting us on the chopping block and all that. Now we we done with that. We done with all that. We don't need y'all in our areas. Stop coming to our to our cribs. Right. No. Look, look that's the next campaign. Stop, Stop coming, coming to our, our cribs. cribs. Literally. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Well, look, the, the next question is actually for you in the chat. Folks were asking how that the they know that the play is still being created, but like, how do they, you know, follow the play? Is there information right now that you can share about the play in terms of like where to see it or how to keep up with you? Oh, yeah. Um, so so right now, um, M MFP helped us get the, get this fund funding. So shout out to MFP, you know. Um, they definitely helped us get this funding. It's a little bit. Hopefully, we can um, later on down the line get more. I am doing my own play, History Repeats Itself, where it shows how um, basically history, you know what it means, history repeats itself. Back to slavery. That's what it is. Sorry. You know what I mean? So it, it highlights the uh, families. Um, so Joyce knows about it. J-Mac for Families is uh, definitely hands in on it. Um, so anytime you can ask Erin, uh, Erin about it, if anybody knows Erin, um, Miles, uh, Miles Cloud, um, yeah, she uh, is definitely involved in it. So um, you can reach out to her. Um, Shalonda knows about it. Um, JMAC for Families, um, yeah. And I have my own personal email, um, Desiree Wright, which is my D-E-S-S-E-R-A-Y-W-R-I-G-H-T-T -S -S -E at gmail.com. Um, you can contact me. I can keep you updated on how the play is going, where we're at with it. Um, it's two T's at D, two T's at um, gmail.com. And so, um, yeah, you can hit, hit me up. Definitely just the way I acted, this is how this play is. I'm trying to get it out just like that. You know, uh, it's a lot of comedy, humor, um, but it's us. It's our stories. Our, our stories on this on, on the front of this. This is us. And as Sarah put in the chat, Desiree, I dropped your email in the chat. I'll fix it in a second with the two T's. Um, and also we'll be sharing more information about it. As we're closing out in our final few minutes, McCall, Shalanda, any way that folks can stay active with your work or stay in touch with you or or anything. And also just emphasizing Tanisha in the chat, this is us. So 
Yes, big shout out to my sis, Tanisha. Um, people can reach out to me uh, two ways. Um, if you're in the Harlem area and you are looking for public defense, uh, family defense, we do holistic uh, defense. They can definitely reach out to me and I can put them to different people in different practices. So my email is scurtis at ndsny.org. But with the work that I do as a birth worker um, in, in that work, my email is shalonda.traphousedoulas uh, at gmail.com. Um, and so I do, I want to bring freedom dreams into other boroughs, into other states, um, just globally taking this community-based freedom dreaming uh <laughs> I wouldn't even call it a workshop. Like, it's just like, I would just, our community just being and existing. I want to continue that and grow that. And so if there are other folks out there that want to, you know, develop and, and, and uh, create space for folks in their communities, I would love to come and bring that framework um, around um, educate, elevate, activate. Um, and so that's what I want to continue to do. And I love uh, Macau's book. So buy the book. Cause can't nobody tell you nothing when you know the, what the what the laws are and were. Be like you can bring up the data. <laughs> so cop the books, educate yourselves, and that way our communities can be free. Thank you, and I'm happy always to be in community and connection. My email, I somehow I can't have the chat, but some you can put my email in the chat. I'm on Twitter also. Uh, I am always I talk to any reporter anytime. Always happy to give kind of a historical perspective for your work for your advocacy. Uh, and happy to kind of support. I, I, I do the work in which like I go to archives and look at old papers and letters. I love it. But that's so whenever I can bring that and make that relevant, like it, it makes my day. I'm always happy to, to talk and, and support. Uh, my new project is about the history of the Adoption Safe Families Act. The history is as ghoulish as the law. Uh, I, and I am happy to talk more about that as we work to repeal uh, ASFA and help uh, maintain families together and be free. Thank you. Thank you all so You're much. Right. So appreciative of the three of you. You all are so amazing and constantly pushing this work forward. Thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate it over your lunchtime hour. Um, please stay connected. I, I put everyone's email in the chat, the link to McCall's book. Um, and then of course, continue to stay tapped into JMAC for Families and the work that we do for more um, events and programming such as this. So everyone have a great rest of your day. Have a great end of Pride and Family Preservation Month. And still we're in the spirit of Juneteenth. So Juneteenth as well. Have a great one, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.